morning, welcome to another AFEMS, the fifth edition of AFEMS. It is returning to Rhodes after, what, two years? Via WITS and UCT. My name is <laughs> Professor Linda Jichanda Spencer. I am a professor here, associate professor in the Department of Literary Studies at in, in English, and this is Professor Shalin Khan, who is a professor in visual arts, associate professor in visual arts at Wits University. Afem started here, started with me, her, and um, Dr. Tando Giovanni, who is also a member of my department. And we've been moving around, but it's glad, we're glad to be back in Makanda at Rhodes University where it began. And I hope you have a huge, a, a very enjoyable time here. Shalene's going to say a few things and then the Dean will welcome us and then we'll go straight into the keynote address. No guys, fifth anniversary. That's not enough of an applause for all of us. <laughs> I mean, FMs is not just the organizations. FMs is every single one of you who come and invest year and year after. And you know how hard it is to keep black women's initiatives going year after year, finding funding for it. Um, so we're really grateful to our funders. We're really grateful to our sponsors uh, and to all of our volunteers and workers. You'll see that there's a lot of labor behind everything. Um, so we really would like to welcome you all to AFEMS 2023. Um, and I think this year's uh, theme um, is one that I've always personally identified. The time, you know, in, you know the moment you came to the word feminism and there's something about it that caught your tongue. And then when you learned that there was such a thing as African and black feminisms, and then your tongue just rolled around nicely in your mouth. <laughs> and then that point when you heard the words feminist killjoy. And you found that it came from Ghanaian author Ama Ata Aidu. I'd like to take a few seconds of, of, of your time to have a moment of silence for Ama Ata Aidu who passed away a few weeks ago. But we are here to celebrate the beautiful life and works of this amazing, amazing Ghanaian scholar. Um, so just a few seconds of silence, please. Thank you very much. We're also here to celebrate Bell Hooks. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the moment he changed all of our lives, um, and to celebrate the love that we have for somebody who we would never meet, but who changed all of us so much when the moment we encountered our works. We are also here to celebrate all of you, our fellow sisters Killjoy. And I can't tell you how much it pleases my heart to see so many of you who have come time and time again to be with us from all parts of the world. Um, and so looking forward to today's keynote. <laughs> and every single keynote and every single book launch and exhibition and presentation because once I, all the abstract came in I think already my excitement levels were like up there because I knew this was going to be awesome uh, special shout out of course to all the familiar faces uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm always glad to see uh, Sipokazi uh, Yvette, Joy, Corinne, Cor yes. yes, all of yes. these people. So welcome, and we hope it's going to be fantastic. And to all new people as well who's coming for the first time, I hope this will be the first of many more affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Greetings, everyone, and thanks for coming to this wonderful conference. I've got the easiest work to do. It's not an intellectual work. It's just to really give you the freedom of the house and the freedom of the institution. So on behalf of the university and the vice chancellor, I want to welcome you to this uh, version of um, AfriFems conference. 
I would like to just say one uh, very quick thing. I would really appreciate the kind of robust debates that you guys are ready to undertake at this moment. And I would like to challenge you, in fact, going forward, considering the growth of this initiative that started at some point on a very low note and has been gathering momentum over the years. I would like to challenge you about the possibility, Linda and company, uh, of maybe, maybe thinking of establishing or applying audaciously for a such a chair in African feminism, which I believe is an institution. which I believe as an institution we will begin to support if you guys are ready to launch such an audacious bid. We will be very much keen to support this. I would like you therefore to just enjoy yourself now and reflect and we talk afterwards. Please have the freedom of the place. Enjoy yourself. When I see people like you gathered in this space, I see a future in terms of repositioning scholarship from the global north which has dominated the studies of feminism and so on, to thinking more closely about the kind of constraints that we have on this continent in relation to understanding the role uh, and position of women in society, in economic development, in contemporary politics, and in everyday life. So please have uh, a beautiful moment during the course of this week. I thank you. Athems is very informal. There's nothing for strict and I don't know, rigid about it. So I'm introducing the keynote speaker, who is Professor Dina Ligag. I don't have anything written down, so everything I'm going to say is out of my head. <laughs> Dina, if I forget things, no worries. Our bios, her bio is in the book, so you can read it. But I'm introducing Professor Dina Ligaga, who is an associate professor in the Department of Media Studies at Wits University. And Professor Dina Ligaga and I are collaborators on different initiatives. The first is the Afri um, uh, urban, urban Connections, what is it, Ukafi? Ukafi? Urban Connections in African Popular Imaginaries, which is a Melon funded project that has enabled this conference to take place for five, for, on the five different occasions. Hello, Polo. Um, on five different <laughs> occasions. So, and not only that, Professor Ligaga and I are editors of the Journal of East African and Lit Literary and Cultural Studies. So we are kind of like, yeah, and we come connected in many ways. But um, one of the things that I really like about Dina's work is the way in which she's looking, in, with the way in which she looks at women, especially contemporary women in social media spaces. So I am looking forward to the work, the, her, work to, her talk today, and she's written a book about women and, and visibility in the popular culture in Kenya, and I hope that we're going to hear a lot more about that. Today, Dina, we're honored to have you as our first keynote of Athens, the fifth Athens city. Thank you. Okay, hi. I hope you can all hear me. In my lecture rooms, I always look at the person sitting right at the back. Can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so, so much, Linda and Shalene, as well as all those who have helped make today possible for me to be here today. When I first got the invitation to be a keynote, one of the keynote speakers, I remember thinking, uh-uh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Until Linda promised me more time. Um, because as you all know, <laughs> as you all know, I'm always running out of time at AFEMS. Either way, I have been part of this AFEMS community since 2017, and I'm quite happy to see so many familiar spaces, faces, as well as see new faces here today. I've come to appreciate this conference space as a nurturing space for careers in African feminisms, as well as what I call a conceptual safe space for all of us who participate in it. I'm very grateful. 
I'm also honored to be here to speak to the broader theme of this conference in which we get to think collectively, as a collective, about the generative qualities of the idea of the feminist killjoy in an African setting. Through this theme, we pay homage to feminist icons who have left us recently, including the literary legend Ama Ata Aido, feminist extraordinaire whose words we draw on today. We also pay homage to bell hooks who taught us so much about what it means to fight for our right to be in this world with its multiple oppressions. We mourn the passing of yet another literary uh, giant, uh, Michele Mugo, who was a trendsetter in the field of creative writing and critical thinking in literature. These women led by example by demonstrating what was possible for black and African women scholars, writers, and creatives, and by teaching us that ordinary, ordinary women navigate the world in ways that could be recognized if only we paid attention. That we, as African women, inhabit that world and are conscious of the multiple oppressions that shape it. But also, as academics, we enter into this world in order to illuminate what those patterns of oppression look like. Today, I want to think about how African women's practices of refusal are enabled and embedded within the publicness of online culture. Such publicness, as I've argued elsewhere, becomes a mode of operation and of existence, and that by pushing against it, rather than working within it, African women's modes of existence and being are initiated and ignited. The emerging counter publics and intimate publics enable parallel and alternative discourses to thrive. I begin by thinking about what <clears throat> I begin by thinking about what Amata I do enables through her body of work. I do provides us with the example of what it means to have courage to state our truths no matter how big or small. In her wonderful book, Our Sister Killjoy, one encounters this courage in its many iterations through the eyes of Sissy as she makes her observations during her sojourn abroad, from the intimacy she shares with her young German friend to what we now can label the everyday strategies of decolonization. Through this courage, I read a form of refusal, one that is the embodiment of post-colonial politics that draw from a counter-hegemonic structure of difference. In the world that I do makes possible, women find safe spaces in which, in which to chat, engage, and form effective networks in the everyday, away from frameworks that shape dominant public cultures. Our, sisters, our sister Killjoy signals a solidarity that is necessary for fracturing the normalcy of misogyny, <coughs> colonialism, racism, imperialism, and sexism. I do safe space is a provision for voicing and being. It is this inscription of African women as agentic subjects that occupies our minds today as we gather today in this conference space. No matter what situation, simple or complex, her female characters find themselves in, they have varying forms of agency. With that agency, they explore and question the world and its ideologies, sometimes existing uninvited and unwanted. What draws one to the world that I do makes possible is the idea of possibility to write, inscribe, identify difference in the world. Listening to and engaging the impressive work that I do leaves behind, I'm struck by how generous and expansive her presentation of Africa is through the eyes of an African woman. I do was a lens through which we understood the world, the lens of a writer, but also the lens of a pan-African woman. Through this lens, we understand the productive meanings of the word killjoy. And I'm here cross-referencing um, Sarah Ahmed's work, of course, on the feminist killjoy. I do invite us into the interior world of the African woman as a thinker, as an interrogating figure, as a philosopher, and as a seeker of justice. She makes us want to return to the beginning and ask the real questions. What are the issues affecting African women? And how can we, in our various capacities, as African scholars, 
African feminist thinkers engage these issues ethically and productively. So in my paper today, I want, to, I want to invite you to think with me about the idea of refusal as a way of doing killjoy politics in online, online spaces in Africa. Drawing on African and black feminist theories, as well as theories of African popular culture, I think about acts of refusal as method, as method of thinking about how women in Africa navigate these online spaces. First, I think about what public acts of refusal mean and contemplate their symbolic meanings and how they can be read and how we can read, read these meanings as placeholders for African women's politics of inclusion and belonging. Secondly, I consider what acts of refusal in everyday engagements online might look like for an African woman or for African women more generally in the context of collective consciousness. I use examples um, that might seem random, but these are just examples I've picked up uh, in the course of the work that I do on women, visibility, and popular culture. I take killjoy politics to mean a generative site of thinking about how African women occupy the porous public-private site through their articulations. My methodological assumptions stem from the fact of the gendered nature of public spaces that has left women with little to no clear avenues for engaging freely in public. The interface between the public and the private become a key point of locution where that which is private links with that which is public through communities of engagement. Indeed, much of the thinking in this paper, tentative as this thinking is, is framed around the idea of counter-publics as well as balanced idea of intimate publics. I'm particularly interested in exploring practices of refusals as um, sites for navigating freedom or freedoms. The fact that these online spaces are ephemeral and in constant flux is useful in my analysis. I argue it is in this state of flux or continuous movement that we can register the gravity of what these acts of refusal mean. The fact that these pieces of data can disappear at any time um, can itself be considered a safe space for, for various social actors. But it also creates a chance for the researcher to identify moments that are significant. And these moments also exist through absence and traces. I hope to show the correlation between an archive that shifts, changes, and sometimes disappears, and how one speaks and articulates refusal as an African woman in the online space in order to enable an understanding of refusal as an epistemological position from which um, um, these subjectivities engage in the digital space. In order to theorize in order to theorize how and why African women's practices can be read in the context of refusals, it is useful to think about how they, habitu they are habitually silenced online. In today's digital environment, it's common to talk about how, how much the digital space broadens the public sphere. However, we also know that this is an oppressive space where existing social structures of dominance are replicated. Scholarship on online harassment with a focus on women, highlights the perpetual presence of this hostility. While many, regardless of gender, are harassed online, the tenure and texture of the harassment differs for women. And here I, um, I, I directly cite the work of Pumla Ola. Or in Soraya Chemali's word, words, it is sexualized and sustained. So here I'm citing, I'm citing Ola's work on uh, the female fear factory, um, which I'm sure most of you have encountered. This perpetual fear that women walk with also exists online. Debbie Jing and Eugenia Siapera termed this abuse new anti-feminist sentiment, which according to Chemali, employs socially tolerated gendered slurs, traditionally gendered shaming, and normalized levels of violence against women offline. In other words, the blurring of the online offline spaces ensures that patterns of abuse are re replicated across spaces. In this world of exclusions, both online and offline, women have variously negotiated their, ex their existence. There is scholarship, existing scholarship that looks at 
what I call the strategies that women employ to navigate sites of oppression and discrimination. And here I'm citing a very, um, well, seems old, but to me constantly present, the work of Christine Obo from way back in 1980, where she talks about these kinds of strategies. What is of interest here is how we can think about the idea of strategy when mapping online forms of refusal. This scholarship highlights strategic strategies including economic, social, and cultural, built into women's everyday experiences that enable them to think about survival in new ways. Here, watching and listening can be as much a part of those strategies as boldly standing up for one's own beliefs, arts, action, or sense of place and belonging in the world. In contexts of extreme oppression, strategies can be discreet, contained within private conversations, whispered in small, tight circles, passed down from one generation of women to another, stored up in riddles, stories, gossip, and rumor. Avenues for retrieving these strategies and passing them along to a new generation abound. Feminists ask questions around these strategies in order to highlight, as well as to identify, ways in which women continue to survive and thrive despite the violence of their everyday existence. I'm interested in understanding both the bold, loud, public proclamations by women dubbed killjoys, difficult, too loud, too something. I'm equally interested in other online practices that involve collective consciousness around common issues. This is done by sharing, whether this is done by sharing narratives, congregating around a hashtag, sharing stories about experiences and testimonies, or sharing strategies. My argument is that practices of refusal are as overt as they are discreet, but they nonetheless constitute important moments in the broader genealogy of women's, African women's lives. To shine a limelight on how African women have come to be read online is part of the work that I hope my longer project engages. My work is a continuation of existing scholarship that celebrates iconic women who have broken barriers and bounds of societal expectations. Those difficult women, riotous women, killjoys. Importantly, these women are not always universally recognized as iconic in the traditional sense, but they appeal to their counterparts that recognize their value as examples of what it means to be free. This, this women's publicness in particular spaces fall outside of mainstream cultural expectations and provide avenues for productive thinking. Might it be possible to read these women as placeholders, symbolic of possible freedoms? I have often returned to Pumla's work um, on Brenda Farsi in a chapter titled, When a Good Black Woman is Your Weekend Special. The chapter artfully surfaces a variety of useful key points for navigating the figure of the riotous woman within popular culture. These key points become methods for reading the killjoy figure who refuses to conform. Fassi is here read as radical and brave, a trendsetter, contradictory, and able to hold the attention of her audience across cultures, race, class, and sexual identities. She ignites debates around a host of important issues just by being herself. She refuses to self-censor, which according to Ola, allows her a variety of choices and agency in which she inhabits uncharted subjectivities with ease and fluidity. Her fame revolves around scandal and controversy, inviting new debates around sexuality, gender, and race in South Africa. Fassi creates new sites for negotiating what it might mean to read a black woman in South Africa. While a comparative analysis of various iconic African women figures is impossible, for obvious reasons, it is possible to begin to map similarities in methodological approaches to reading riotous women in popular culture. Brenda Fassi's transgressive agency manifests differently in the online platform where more and more women are beginning to inhabit the digital public space with a level of fearlessness not previously observed. I look at such fearlessness as entry 
strategies into a hostile space that does not tolerate forms of transgression that use up existing systems of dominance. So for instance, in my book on women and visibility, I tell the story of a young woman who became a national sensation very briefly in Kenya because it was revealed or in the news, it, it, you know, news broke out that she'd been arrested for failing to pay a hefty hotel bill. News stories speculated that she had been ditched by a rich foreign man and left to fend for herself. What the story was, the story was in the lesson that young women were supposed to learn from her as an example. She was a cautionary tale. But what drew my attention to this tabloid spillage was the young woman's reaction. She boldly maintained a nonchalant attitude and refused to own her shame that was being put on her by the news media and by social commentaries. <coughs> Where she, she was dubbed party animal and good time, good time girl, and, and here I'm, being, um, I'm, I'm, using, I'm not using all the words that were used to describe her. She spoke as a celebrity. She used the platform to promote her career as a budding musician. And, it, and even for just a little period, snagged a job as a radio DJ. <laughs> she got people to pay her bill. She got people to bail her out of jail. This was a classic case of refusal on the young woman's part. There was tension. There was a tension that was created by her publicness, a friction that could not be resolved easily. And that allowed for the recognition of a significant moment in gender discourses in Kenya. It's this sentiment of refusal that shapes my thinking around these practices. And here, I take us to a different example of a different type of woman who also has occupied and stayed in the tabloid's eye in Kenya for a while now. She is a politician. She holds public office. On her, on her, website, on her website page, Millie Odiambo is described in this way. Millie is variously Describing the poli this is, I'm now reading from the website, is variously described in the political arena as brazen, bold, brave, combative, courageous, feisty, fearless, outspoken, outstanding, loud, leader. Whatever her description, whatever description you may give her, what is clear is she, she spares no punches and is no pushover. She has cut out a niche as a fearless and unapologetic defender of women's rights of children's rights. This has sometimes been seen to land her in trouble. During a parliamentary debate gone wrong on the 18th of December 2015 on the infamous security laws amendment bill, Millie claimed that she was physically assaulted and sexually harassed by some male politicians. Any other woman politician in a country that is seen as largely conservative and patriarchal may have shied away from stating the same but not Millie. Instead, she went ahead and posted on her Facebook page that when two male MPs tried to undress her, she finished the job for them. The post not only went viral, but spurred debates on whether she was right or wrong and whether indeed she was attacked. Her subsequent justification is that the penultimate political degradation of women often centers below the belt. When men want to humiliate you politically, they will attack you sexually. By finishing the undressing they began, she reckoned, she took away the power to ridicule her by showing them that she's not afraid of her sexuality or her nakedness. So that's the end of that uh, description from her online page. But the almost public position is instructive. It indicates a form of refusal that returns to the body as a site of war. But the ambo, like many women activists before her, uses her body as a way of protesting violence against women who choose to occupy public's, public office. Indeed, several scholars have outlined the ways in which women politicians are intimidated and silenced in their dealings with the political, within the political space. Sylvia Tamales, when hands begin to crawl, reminds us of this form of doing <laughs> politics and why it is that women continue to be pushed aside in such spaces. Indeed, as Masiana Were elsewhere has shown, 
women have tended to find male political bodies to help them navigate the toxic misogynist political space. Um, and again, of course, where is also citing Amina Mama's work on the same. Milio Odhiambo is but one example of Kenyan, fe of Kenyan female politicians who push back against this culture. We see this in her theatrical proclamations against fellow politicians or when she's protesting an unfair bill. During a live event, a male political aspirant vying for the same political seat as a female aspirant reduced the debate to a personal attack of the woman aspirant, calling her names including sex crazed, socialite, and bimbo. The live event was circulated widely on social media platforms including YouTube and garnered a multitude of misogynist commentary. The goal of the attack by the man was not only to humiliate this woman candidate, but to shame her into silence. Similar modus operandi. Odhiambo did not take this line down. She was among those who, re who, who reacted to this attack and an, in, an equally widely circulated Facebook <coughs> statement, she boldly spoke to the misogynist cultures that give male politicians power over the female counterparts. I was mostly interested in the mode of publicness that Odhiambo chose to engage, to use to engage the issue. It had all the characteristics of the riotous woman in the, public, in the political space, using popular cultural codes for navigation and visibility. In other words, her strategy was to use controversy to get her point across. Thus, in 2016, in a statement that circulated, Millie calls out her male colleagues and their habits of slut-shaming female politicians. She uses herself as an example of what it looks like to break taboo by having conversations about sex and sexuality in public. She challenges not only her male colleagues, but also the wider Kenyan public by speaking about her body and her desire and her sexual pleasures in the public. She begins her statement using the phrase, I love sex, I enjoy sex, I have sex. This embrace of her own sexuality, the, the, it's a longer statement and I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but that, that this embrace of her own sexuality and pleasure becomes a form of refusal. And Patricia, uh, Patricia McFadden has, is, is one of the key uh, feminists who's returned to this site of pleasure as a space for recognizing one's own sexuality and one's own self productively. It is an avenue for navigating freedom. And it is a way of speaking within this heteronormative culture. Um, okay, so I'm not, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Yeah? Oh, so I still have, t I have time. <laughs> Um, so to to, <laughs> to return, so she so um, um, sorry, I, was, I just lost my place. So Odiambo pushes back on several occasions using protest language of nakedness, and and we do know in in feminist work that this is something, especially in African feminism, and Sylvia Tamale does talk a lot about this. That this is something that this space, the body as a site of war, is something that African women have gone back to over and over. But McFadden is also saying that pleasure is a way of speaking back to misogyny and sexist, sexist cultures in, the, in Kenyan politics, in African politics. The online space offers Odhiambo and other women like her a convenient platform for protest. And she, she relies on the internet's ability to make scandalous talk and outrageous comments go viral. Thus communicating her refusals, her words, and using the multiple avenues available to her in a way that can make herself be heard. To return to Chemali's words, simply by virtue that women are the people doing the expressing, their online participation alone represents challenges to traditions, norms, and conventional obstacles to equality. Then, almost inevitably, the manosphere fueled by threatened masculinities and framed neatly by words like innovation, community, revolution, and free speech intrudes to remind women that, after all, these activities are not for them. Women can take risks and defy what the internet broadly, off what the internet broadly offers as a space of hostility. 
I recognize the symbolic meanings of, of Milio Diambo's actions and words. I understand the wider functions of what she's doing and what they mean. Other women doing, we know that other women are doing the same on platforms such as TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter, every day. They practice refusals by being loud and unmanageable, by producing effective messages of defiance. Feminist methodologies allow us to experiment in our thinking about what these things mean, allow us as researchers to identify the potency of such moments and the cumulative work that is going on here. Now my last example moves us slightly away from the idea of the iconic woman figure. Despite the rise in the number of African women willing to leave their truths publicly and bravely in the spotlight, a different kind of online trend exists that allows women to form communities through networks of knowledge and narrative. This collective consciousness around common issues have mushroomed through hashtag protests, for instance, leading to changes in important, um, hashtag pro protests for instance, leading to important changes in gender policies in the workplace, especially around sexual harassment. Scholarship that track the impact of such studies of cancel cultures and their effectiveness in revealing problems have had, you know, have a long, have long, that have long been ignored are growing and maintaining the attention of scholars and activists alike. Desri Lewis, Awino Okech, Nanjala Nyabola, among others, have traced the meaning, effectiveness, and impact of hashtags such as Me Too, Men Are Trash, and other hashtags in articulating the anger and refusal towards violent actions against women. In this context now, in this conference, I want to reference something slightly different, and, but still working within the idea of collective networks and, ne and effective networks, and argue that it also allows us to look into other forms of everyday violence and how women are countering them in online platforms through the earlier discussed idea of strategies I use an example here on women's economic survival and how this has come to manifest itself online. I look at the transnational practice by women of putting aside money and resources for a rainy day. Often this money is held in a secret place and it's meant to be a form of emergency fund to help women get out of difficult situations. In this transnational practice, it is, in, it is interesting to see how it has come up again and again to capture the African woman's desire for economic independence, much as it does for a variety of other women across the world. It's, it is the practice of keeping aside what online has now become known as vex money. What drew me first to this example is a memory of encountering a chain of testimonies and personal accounts regarding this culture. Vex money, um, uh, as, as Naomi Jackson describes it, is a Caribbean phrase that refers to money stashed on your person or in a secret place, normally a bra, a bank account, your grandmother's Bible, your sneakers, to be spent only in case of emergency, brought upon by a once stable situation, suddenly becoming vexed, usually, but not always, because of a man. C. The need for a swift exit in response to a threat of sexual assault. See also the dissolution of a relationship, the loss of a job, or being placed, or displaced from your home. What Jackson captures here is a sentiment, a desire for safety, a form, of, a form of safety net that women have generated in order to survive the precarity of especially heterosexual situations. I'm interested here in how an age-old practice of economic survival practiced among generations of women make it, makes its way online. It's interesting how this idea connects generations of women of different races, continents, and nations who come into this space that the world, congre that the world congregates to comment on by, the way, by way of sharing testimonies. This cross-cultural quality indicates a new form of engagement for African women an opening up of space that allows others to share experiences and to learn and to create possibilities for learning. Several of the testimonies on economic freedom indicate the presence of control and abuse. The online platform brings together different people who share their experiences, raising awareness about women's strategies. If we return to the example I gave earlier, the young lady 
who was, who was stuck in a bad situation because of a hotel bill that she could not pay and who was arrested because a man allegedly dumped her in an expensive hotel room. These are the uses of Vexman. In a recent news item, media personality Kanyimbao is said to have used her Vex money to travel back to South Africa from Dubai where she had been holidaying with her boyfriend. I haven't studied the full situation, so I'm not sure how it works, but I do know that she ignited the word Vex money. And according to her, she told her boyfriend that she was leaving for the salon, but instead bought a first class ticket to South Africa <laughs> where she returned. Her boyfriend saw on Instagram that she was actually, in fact, in South Africa. <laughs> Bao ignited talk about Vex money then and the importance of protecting oneself and the importance of always having options. If you go online and just type out Vex money, you will see the kinds of ways in which this word co congregates ideas around this kind of survival. What new lessons do such avenues allow in the realm of the everyday struggles to survive? How can we think about these practices in wider engagements with online spaces and what they enable and make possible? So in conclusion, this paper has offered examples of what refusal might look like when we're talking about women in the African context. Referencing existing cultures in which women defy conventional ex expectations of conformity, I argue that developing a method for reading the sites as telling a wider narrative of defiance is important. I do this tentatively, but hope that the ideas that grow here will form a bigger project. What my paper highlights is related to the question of method in online cultures by using ideas that help us to navigate the site of popular culture as an alternative avenue of engagement. I read refusal as an act of, of the everyday that is utilized differently through the visibility of iconic figures who can then be used as examples and as placeholders or through avenues that signal possibilities of communities of knowledge and solidarity or sharing experiences and of exchanging ideas. My paper attempts to answer the question, how might we read women's publicness or articulations online as practices of refusal in the online context? I've considered what it means to think about the bold, the visible, and the defiant figure in different contexts as a placeholder for women. It is a method of finding women whose actions can shift debate, highlight an issue, or perform transgressive acts. How do we read the individual actor as performing feminist interventions? What does the digital space enable for the African woman? Secondly, what kinds of new communities of engagements are, we cr are created online? And how do, we, how do they make it easier for women to realize that they are not alone and that the individualized suffering is in fact embedded in a deeply problematic social structure. What does the sharing, what does sharing enable? And how does the involvement within such spaces create room to understand ways in which women refuse <coughs> to be under the control of often more powerful partners? What kinds of freedoms are created? Thank you. promised you time. I gave you time. You had three more minutes to do that. I got all um, the time. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. Before we go to the next session, we have time for question and answers. We have um, 10 minutes or 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers, for suggestions, for comments, for anything that you want to do. So please raise your hand, um, and while you're thinking about what to ask Dina, um, Vex money. I had no idea that there was a name to it, but I know what it is. I know that I, I, I don't know if I have Vex money, but I do. Because <laughs> if I say I have Vex money, some of my friends will think what's happening at all. But I do have I stashed have money. money. You have to have Vex money. <laughs> well, is it always Vex money? But we always have these stashed monies away. Like I have in my bags, like I have a 20 rand note for when I run out of money at 
buying water, a fifty <coughs> rand. I have all these little pockets of money. It's an interesting way. But anyway, questions? Can I get? Okay. All right, Joy, you get the first. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Lina. Welcome to Athens. Um, I'm happy to be here. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Hi, Joy. This is our space, and then it's good to speak the truth. You have raised vital issues that women should speak their truth, big or small. My question is, and still become agents of positive change, how is this possible that a woman would speak her truth, whether big or small, and not become a neyman? You know what I mean by a neyman? A Naaman or the woman with the issue of love. Naaman was a great captain, but he was leprous. How do you achieve that without becoming stigmatized? That's what I'm saying. Did I make sense? Yeah, yeah. If you yeah, speak yeah. your truth, whether big or small, in the society as a woman, without putting yourself together, you are eventually, well, depends on the context. You become, I'm using that illustration of the woman with the issue of blood, you know, they shut up, keep quiet, keep quiet, you are smelling, you are smelling. That is what our society may offer that woman if she has not succeeded in getting some things together for herself. That is what I mean. You know, the woman with the issue of blood, she with the problem, and the society, shut up, keep quiet, you are smelling, get out, we don't want you. <laughs> so that's my question. How do you speak your truth, big or small? Still become an agent of positive change in our very um, unique patriarchal society without becoming, I don't want to come out straight at length, so I'm using the, the, the allusion, woman with the issue of law. She's a woman, she's in the society. Okay. Shut up! Okay. Keep quiet! All right. Away. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you, Joy. Uh, Pumla? Dina, thank you so much. Um, I really miss listening to you. You live in my head, I read you all the time. But I just, I Clearly we read joy. each other. <laughs> so I have, I have, I don't, I don't have a question. I have, I'm going to offer something and then okay. you do okay. whatever you want with it. Um, I mean, thank you for, for this methodological gift. Um, because I think that, I think that part of what I, I mean, there's so many things, but what I'm going to talk about, um, uh, is this, um, part of the great gift of this particular, um, uh, intervention for me, um, as a methodological intervention is that it helps us, I think, get out of, it helps us, it helps offer us a way out of many cool de socks that I think even as African feminists sometimes kind of confront us, right? Yes. Um, so I love that you present us with refusal, not as resistance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because we all get irritated with the resistance and we all like, we're not just resisting, we're doing other, but then we still engage in this discourse of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it helps us deal more meaningfully with what we're trying to do when we say, when we express our irritation around resistance, I think refusal, as you, as you offer it to us, um, gives us a much more, um, a much more beautiful, really, um, way to think about to think about kind of uh, aesthetic behavior um, by African women, by troublesome African women, by riotous African women. I think secondly, part of the gift for me. Sorry, Linda, I, I'm just really concerned. I, I see the look. <laughs> I want to hear this. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that I'm, I'm just absolutely overjoyed about is that it also helps me. So first I think it helps us as African feminists generally. Um, I think it helps me also in terms of thinking about that other nightmare for women everywhere, but certainly for African women, which is approval. Right? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that part of what you're offering us with, or what is clear to me in what you're offering us in this methodological, and I think it's important methodological um, intervention of, 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 of refusal, is a way to get around this notion of approval. Because I think approval becomes such a trap, right? Mm -hmm. Because it traps us in, in resistance, it also traps us in this 
um, you know, one of the ways in which we are most punished, or riotous African um, behavior is most punished, is this idea that then you'll be on your own, and Africans don't like to be exiled, right? Like, you are not African, which is why they use it, even though they know it's nonsense, and we know it's nonsense, but we're still responding, mm. right? So it's a way to not even waste our time with approval. Because in fact, mm. what these women that you use, both in your wonderful books, both in your kind of extensive scholarship on, 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 on what Lily Onyango does, and, and now with this new work, is that this is not, the refusal allows us to think about how African women can respond to the threat of policing and approval and all of this nonsense and controversy without sidestepping it, hmm. right? Because it seems to me often we try to find safe ways away from controversy. Hmm. We try to say, no, yeah, but I'm not going to. Whereas you are saying, actually, no, let's not avoid. You kind of, it's not meaningful to avoid because when you're trying to avoid controversy, you are trapped in the patriarchal framing, right? <laughs> So what you're saying is refusal is in fact, no, you can hijack the controversy. <laughs> refusal is only possible when we do not look away from controversy. So I don't, I could go on. Thank you, Dina. I'm just very excited. And I just, oh my God. I so, hear you. So Thank, you yeah. Thank, Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Just, what, you're, Benita, yeah, you're the last one. And then we'll take another round if there's time. If, so you're the last one. Um, I'd like you to speak a little bit more about disappearance as refusal, particularly in relation to social media, okay. as a shifting and a disappearing archive, right? So women who intentionally disappear mm -hmm. um, and, and delete their posts, for instance, and we are looking for them, trying to write about them, but we can't find them because they're intentional mm -hmm. about this. Yes. 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 Oh, now that the talk is out of my way, I must confess I hate the question and answer session. <laughs> because this is a time when often you get the worst kinds of questions, you get the most passive aggressive responses, and you don't know what to do with it, and you can only politely say, good question. <laughs> But I love today's question and answer session because again, this is our firms yeah. and this is the space. So anyway, um, thank you so much for all your questions. And Joy, I think in many ways Pumla is responding to what you're asking. What does it mean to, 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 to stand with the idea of the possibility of risk and still be able to say your truth? So you use the word posit positive, you know. But the thing is, we. It reaches a point where that response is not the issue. We are not interested in what that means. We are interested in the, who, who takes the risk to stand anyway. All right? And the point that I was making with someone like Milio Diambo is she has developed a strategy you know, where she's realized that if she works within the normal frameworks, you know, oh, this is wrong, what you're doing is wrong, no one's going to hear her. And so she's taken to, 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 to this popular culture space, what I call popular culture, I mean the other ways of thinking about it. She's taken to this space of the ridiculous, but she's using it to her own advantage. advantage. And, and she will say what appears as the most outrageous things because she knows the tabloids will pick it up. Yeah. So where she, in the, in the famous uh, Facebook post, which I chose not to read today because I've, I've, I think I've talked about it quite a lot, um, tabloids ran away with it. Millie says she loves sex, that's the, ta the headline, right? Or, you know, similar silly things. But she always makes a point. And, and if you read, if you, if, you, if you kind of track her, you get, to get, you get to have this sense that as a lawyer, as a feminist, over the years she has tried to fight in the way that you're talking about, where she's, she's, she's tried to be heard through the avenues that exist, but then, you know, people are either too busy that they don't care. Mm -hmm. And so she does these things, but with her body and with her words that, that help to get her to this place where what she says and does seem risky. But is it? To who? For her, she's just saying, and she's then getting the attention, and then she can say what it is that she wants to say. Right. Um, and, and maybe 
this is something that we think we can think about again continuously. But then Pumla, um, um, thanks thanks for articulating what I was trying to think and, and wasn't quite coming out, and, and that is the way in which refusal then becomes a different way of doing, right? Um, um, and you're right, a lot of the times when you're thinking about resistance, it's been co-opted. And so we constantly like, okay, yeah, it's another one of those. But then refusal is just refusal. I don't care, you know? And, and, and a lot of that sentiment is always, for me, captured with, um, if you look at social media posts, where um, um, when I first started, I remember when I first started working in this field, I, and I used to look at this um, figure, this woman called Vera Siddika, way back. I mean, she's, she's, she's now called an influencer. Um, this language <laughs> caught up with me. I started looking at her way, way, way before when in Kenya, the idea, the word socialite was so much more used, and it was used negatively, but these women owned it, right? Um, um, and it's interesting to me how they practiced refusal even then. Because they garnered this negative attention and they just turned it into money, right? And, and, and that for me has always given me that space to think uh, critically. And, and what I love about feminism and, and feminist methodologies is that part of it is about the attraction of playing with the, that experimental. So looking at at, 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 at our field as this place where you can experiment with ideas. It's not rigid. Anyone who comes to you and says, this is how it's done is lying to you, right? Um, and, and you know, just being able to identify, because a lot of what happens with women works in that moment of change. So because social change inspires us to think about what is happening in that moment. Um, Yes, and, and you know, and, and in, in, in many ways, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm responding to you and not responding to you. I'll, I'll continue thinking. Um, so the refusal as visibility. So I like your point. Yes, there are women, and a lot of it. So the way, from what I've read, a lot of women who disappear disappear because of intimidation. But that's not true, as you're saying, and I agree with you 100%. Sometimes women disappear because I can. I'm intentionally disappearing, you know? Because this space is just not good for my soul. Yeah, it's just not working, and that's okay, right? And, 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 and then that sort of also lends to, lends to the, what I was talking about, that flux, that constant shiftiness of this archive. And so sometimes you don't know when to grab that information, violent as it is. Um, and if you, if, you, if you look at the examples I use in my book, um, there's a chapter that was really, really painful to write, and it was about these women who had been murdered, and, and, and it's, 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 it's ter it was a terrible, terrible, difficult chapter to write. But it's the way that their lives existed online in that moment, because with social media, especially with trends, it's about capturing that moment. After the moment passes, it goes. People have moved on. Um, and, and, and so I, I don't know I think yours is a longer conversation of how we as feminist thinkers then think about how to read that archive. And, and you can read that archive even in its absence, in traces, is what I was trying to sort of say, in what other people say of this person, right? And in, in what you yourself have encountered of this person. But I think it's a longer conversation and I think it's something that's absolutely fascinating. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we've come to the end. Dina, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much for the thank questions, you. Benita, Pumla, and Joy, because that, they've given me something to think about, especially approval. I need to think more about it. Dina, we have a gift for you, so. Oh, I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Would like Time you. Thank and you. <laughs> thank you so much for. <laughs> opening this um, conference and giving all of us something to think about. We have three days with each other. You have three days to find Dina, speak to her if you want to speak to her about anything else. Um, and thank you so much. Thank so you. On behalf of Athens, thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, I just have a few. I, I have a few I have a few housekeeping things to do.
All right, some of you didn't get name tags. Don't worry, the name tags are going to be available now. You'll just go, go to the registration desk and you can get your name tag. At the registration desk, we have two, two stations where you can bedazzle your name tag because we're not just feminists, we're, 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 we're fabulous feminists. So you need to make sure you bedazzle your name tag. That's the difference between this AFEMs and other AFEMs. Um, if you need any assistance, we have people in black t-shirts like this with AFEMs. They are up there. They will help you with all uh, um, any kind of assistance. We are trying, we, very, we try, the reason we have cloth, cloth name tags is because we're trying to be, leave a little footprint and be sustainable. We're not there yet, but we're trying. So we don't have any plastic bottles of water, but we have water. So you need to bring your own bottles and you keep refilling here. Please don't drink the water from the taps. Please do not drink the water from the taps. That just bring a bottle, come to the station here, and refill your bottle anytime that you want. And for venues, all the venues now for the sessions are going to be upstairs, seminar room one, two, and three. We have swapped, I think, seminar two and three for one session. I don't know which session. Micheline. One session, I think, later on in the afternoon. But all the sessions are upstairs, one, two, three. And this is where we'll have all the keynotes and the book launches later on. We're going to have a lot of discussions. And some of the things that are being, that Dina has spoken about now will be explored in other papers, other performances, other presentations um, during the course of the next three days. So you're welcome. Please let's go to the next session because tea is only later on. So go upstairs and yeah, thank you.